on to the next uh, panel discussions. We just wanted to set some context on the OEM for the energy for the program. So as you all know that you know the integrity of the uh, operations and maintenance. So it is an ongoing task that needs to be done on a regular basis. And to maintain the DR system, to ensure their optimal functionality, efficiency and longevity. OEM requires the people, its technology and some tools that includes you know, some technical and financial aspects as well. It also delivers some kind of problem statements that is the lack of timely maintenance of the public owned DRA systems due to lack of ownership at the individual level or maybe due to the lack of skills, supply chain and some of the incentive for the stakeholders. It also has a high transaction cost for the DRA services based on its remoteness of the location and some kind of limited incentive. It also has some kind of budgetary issues for the ONM as well because few of the uh, states or majority places we do not have the budgetary provisions to maintain the system. So in the last discussions, we all have heard about the need, usefulness and effectiveness of the DRE solutions. But now we are speaking on the basic maintenance that is required to maintain those DRE solutions. So and for that, this is what are the requirements that if we have the timely maintenance of the public owned DRE systems uh, and some few budgets, provisionaries, I think we can do the maintenance, uh, perform the basic maintenance in a timely way. What is the need for operation and maintenance? So need here reflects the, you know, the systems needs maintenance that we all know, but uh, the timeline for but the timeline to fix those issues, you know, to identify those issues, highlight those issues, and to rectify those issues that the DR systems has. So that immediate identification and rectification is very very essential and uh, mostly the timely communication so we have many key stakeholders involved in the entire process of this system right so here the some of the basic NGOs are involved some of the basic clean energy enterprises are involved so we need to communicate to them very very stringently and very very promptly to what are the issues that the systems is facing and uh, how to interact between these kind of different stakeholders on a timely manner so that these people come together and uh, you know, rectify those kind of issues with a very, very limited time uh, turnaround time. Then, uh, of course, this uh, maintain these systems, we need some kind of skilled HRs as well, which needs to be available locally. We need to train, we need to identify those kind of local electricians or local technicians, and we need to enhance their skills and uh, you know, train them to how to maintain those systems. So, various kind of operators, technicians and the maintenance personnel, we need to identify locally uh, from the block level, from the village level, we need to make, maintain a good pool of resources for them and then uh, we should ensure the adequate and timely maintenance. Like that, similarly, we can enable the local service maintenance network as well for the solar energy health system. And of course, boosting of the ownership. Ownership is actually what is uh, triggering us to do the maintenance on time. So the more we own the system as ours, so the more the effectiveness and the timeliness will be maintained in uh, maintaining the solar system. And uh, also we need to create a processes and the benchmarks for the costings and uh, documenting what kind of issues are there and why these issues are happening and how do we fix those issues 
so all those documents will also help us in future in giving the training in putting the trainings to the uh, to the end users as well as to the various kind of operators and the technicians as well to take it forward so here are some of the tools for components of the onm that uh, currently we are using uh, and delivering in the states so the some of the technical component like you know how to raise the issues and how to resolve those issues who will do all those issues and what kind of tools that we are using so currently we are using uh, the tools like we are exploring the, the tools like the remote monitoring system where we can remotely assess and monitor the system performance the energy consumption and many other parameters remotely we can see whether the systems are functioning or not and another tool that we are using is through the customer relationship executives that if you are i think you all are aware that we have almost duplicated all the uh, customer uh, uh, customer uh, relationship executive with all the states who are calling the health facilities each month to identify and to uh, you know to document what are the issues that the health facilities are facing in terms of the running of the daily solution so this is another tool that also helps us in getting the issues and addressing it on time remotely and another thing another uh, where we can't reach or uh, the health facilities where we can't reach uh, through the remote monitoring systems because of the network connectivity issues or uh, you know because of any kind of technical issues or because we are the customer relationship is good it can't uh, reach the health facilities because of a number of reasons so they are used also suggest to conduct the physical monitoring also to see what are the exact issues so ultimate aim of getting all those issues is to to get it timely rectified to identify what is the issues are and it get it in timely rectified so these are the tools that we are using on the operations and maintenance system as well these are some of the ecosystem metrics that we are supposed to develop uh, so based on the three parameters that is based on the geography but the public health system and the energy enterprise so coming to the geography part we can we are focusing on the you know scoring parameters where how the terrains are how the what are the kind of disaster vulnerabilities are there then transport and air station and then the accessibility internet network connectivity all those things are triggering to give you some kind of scores for the geography part of that state or for the region or for the country <coughs> and coming to the public health facility any of who are the champions that are available within the state or in the district or in the other local local villages and the what are how how the fund availability is are there within the state government which we can use for the ONN and uh, what kind of adequate uh, you know, skills hr that we have uh, who can take it forward uh, you know uh, for for uh, this uh, maintenance part of the dr solution and how strong is the government system over there to take it forward and the kind of support that we want you know, to to make it more robust and energy enterprises also the availability of the clean energy enterprises within the state Uh, we have to see that one, and then the what are the time the turnaround times uh, that will take to reach to one of the health facilities which is there in the remote locations, and how much time will it take to rectify the issues if we inform them today, right? And then what kind of supply chain? Uh, supply chains are also important part because to rectify our issues, the spares are also required. We need to see whether those spares are locally available or not. and whether they need some kind of transportation from other places uh, for 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 far to other places uh, that also involves cost so many things depends and the what around the market maturity that we have so if we see the scoring parameters you know, uh, <coughs> considering the strong geography and then the public health system is also good and then the energy enterprises are also available with the market maturity good market maturity we can score them as an A1 plus B1 plus C1. If you can see the metrics, we if the score between 10 to 15. So that that way we can derive or some kind of ecosystem metrics and then assess the what kind of ecosystem maturity that we have to perform with the entire context of the OLM model. Uh, this is one of the ecosystem metrics that we have developed, you know, for the northeastern states in terms of the three basic parameters that we have discussed in the last slide. 
But uh, if you see for the northwestern state, that should recognize you that it was most of the states in the northeastern uh, region are the hilly areas and then having a disaster vulnerability like landslides, lightning strikes, heavy rains, and then the local transport are also not accessible very easily. Travel transactions are also uh, high in terms of time as well as cost. Network connectivity also may not be available in the remotest and the parkland areas. In terms of public health systems, <coughs> what we have uh, recognized is the availability of the adequate funds budgeted for the system maintenance. So funds are funds need to be budgeted uh, for the uh, proper ONM within the state and uh, the uh, field manpower. So that also needs to be made available so that you know, uh, if, if you can make uh, every 5 kilometer radius even skill manpower will be there, that will be great enough for us to move ahead for the system maintenance on time. And energy enterprises also supply chain for the solar technology is not that strong enough that we are supposed to be there in the northeastern states. Even the lack of existence of the clean energy enterprises locally available, that's also a challenge for us, but we are still exploring and uh, getting, uh, in getting more number of this on board. And enhanced the, uh, enhancing the turnaround time for the system maintenance, so that is also very, very challenging over there in the northeastern states because of the, 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 the distances and the transportation availability, many factors are involved into this. So the question is what could be the ideal ONM model for the northeastern states that we could you know, think of and we can jointly collaboratively develop that model for the northeastern states and how to build up a strong ecosystem for the clean energy enterprises over here. So these are the mostly the issues that we used to come across on the ONM while we speak on the ONM part. So I've divided into the major part and the minor issues. So coming to the minor issues which may need some kind of repairs or services or replacements. So mostly the you know this this these kind of issues like includes the basic maintenance and then the replacing battery waters, cable, cables which got burnt very often, inverter fuse then array junction box, battery and panel lugs, tightening of the screws, all these are very small things which need basic maintenance kind of thing. Not kind of huge costs are involved, but it can be solved within 24 hours. That is why we kept it in a very minor, minor issues. And this immediately the spheres are also available with them, so they can fix those issues on time. Only thing they need to be, you know, communicated on time. And uh, this is replacing inverter, motherboard, IGBT card, grid protection, MCB, inverter display, all those things may be rectified or should be rectified within 48 hours or less than 48 hours. These are all related to the minor issues. But few of the issues that also comes on the major, major part like disaster related or man-made related, you know, uh, like the floods, uh, due to floods or lightnings or some kind of thefts or, or physical damages or breakages done by some um, so those kind of things we need to be controlled and then those are we are taking as a major issues kind of thing which may need some kind of repair or some kind of replacements but to do that first of all we need to have the budget provisions for doing this so panel battery inverter replacement as per the warranty and the replacement of the key components beyond the warranty so some of the components are there within warranty which we, Maybe the clean and energy enterprises who are installing the systems so over there, they may take care. But after out of warranty products, again, we need some kind of support, uh, budgetary support, you know, to fix those issues on time. Uh, so, mostly these are the two kind of issues broadly that we are taking forward over here. And for just for the example, we have kept one slide because most of the issues are there with life with the inverter. So most of the time we see that the inverter gets shut down. Shut down because of the overload current from the heavy loads, surge voltage from lightning, high voltage spikes. So many other reasons are there. So tipping of the MCB which needs repair and replacement within 24 hours. Again, the, there are some kind of short circuit issues also, insulation damage, burning of the cables, water clogging, uh, either from the top or from the bottom or bottom of the inverter. So again, all these things, if you can see, um, mostly the short circuit issues, cable issues, electric <coughs> issues, 
this all happens and needs, needs some kind of replacements or repairs or basic services. And most importantly, these are for doing all these things, the budgetary provisions are also very, very essential for that. So mostly these are the overall context for the ONL and we have to see how better we can you know, come up with some kind of robust kind of ONL model for the entire northeastern states uh, going forward so that uh, within the very less time around time we can fix the, identify and fix the issues uh, jointly and collaboratively. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arvind. Next, for the next session, I would like to request Rachita uh, to be back on the stage to moderate the session. And we would also like to request our esteemed guests to come on the stage as we announce the event. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome our first speaker, Ms. Eva Manna Nambri. State Program Manager, National Health Mission, Government of Meghalaya. With a tenure spanning over eight years, Ms. Eva Manlam has been instrumental in overseeing and implementing various national health programs in the state. With over two decades of experience in the healthcare sector, specializing in public health program, state health systems, and health insurance, Ms. Eva Wan Lang Nongri has demonstrated expertise in designing and deploying health insurance schemes, optimizing administration value chain, and cultivating strong relationships within hospital networks. Welcome, Kong Eva. Next, we welcome Mr. Ayush Gupta who heads Global Strategy and Performance for Access to Energy at Schneider Electric. Ayush comes with 30 years of rich and diverse experience across strategy, business development, marketing and finance. In his current role, Ayush is responsible for delivering and deploying the Access to Energy program vision of bringing clean electricity to populations globally across emerging markets, both as a fundamental right and a means of social and economic development, with safe, safe, affordable, reliable and sustainable energy technologies and solutions. At Schneider, this is called Electricity for Life and Electricity for Livelihood. Welcome, sir. We now welcome Mr. Fazli Mustafa, Founder and Managing Director, Enrolling Women and Women Services Private Limited. Mr. Fazli has been working in the DRI sector for the last 12 years. ERES, a rural enterprise, works to create holistic ecosystem to provide reliable, decentralized, renewable energy services and solutions for the underserved communities in the country. Okay. He has been working in the sectors of community lighting, health, education, livelihood, disaster relief, and has impacted the life of more than 10 lakh population in the region till date. Welcome to stage, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, uh, we would like to invite Subhasini Srinivasanji, who works as a technical architect at e Governments Foundation. Subhasini has been building digital public goods at the population scale that serves millions of citizens globally. She has over 17 years of experience in the software industry across the US and India. She loves to write and is the author of two books. A big round of applause to all our speakers. And the session is over to you, Rachida. Thank you so much. So, um, so yeah, I mean, thank you, Arpan, for the context setting as well. But just to highlight a few things, um, I think the three key aspects that he mentioned was, you know, how we need to design operations and maintenance models based on the geographical constraints, which has significant costs as well related to it when we look at operations and maintenance as well. 
The second piece that he highlighted was the public health system. And here I would like to just highlight that, you know, it's, it's, one aspect is the availability of funds, but then it's also like how we are utilizing it and are there the right processes to be able to utilize it, you know, in the most efficient manner. The second aspect is I think we couldn't deny that, you know, our health system is extremely efficient right now. Right? So we are procuring and providing medical equipments, medicines, vaccines to the most remotest health facilities. So how do we really leverage on that system itself, right? rather than actually building something which is actually completely new or parallel to it? So recognizing that there is an opportunity there, but how do we really leverage on that? And the third piece is, of course, the energy enterprise aspect, which, which is the main player in delivering the services that we're talking about. And of course, there is an aspect of are they available and how quickly they're able to reach, but it's also saying that they're in the end a private model. So what do we do to ensure their viability? So what kind of partnerships and contracts, information flow, financial flow, is actually going to help them do their job better with the constraints that are already there with the context and with a system that is already in place with the public health departments itself. The other piece that I wanted to lay out as a context was that to our communities and to our medical care providers, it does not matter where energy comes from. What really matters in the end is that if we ensure reliability of energy. And if reliability needs to be there, anything requires maintenance. From our car to this mic to this light to this building. Right? So it's, it's not an unknown factor. But what we need to basically dial down on or buckle down on is to say that how do we really ensure that reliability is maintained and systems are there to ensure that that happens. So with that, and, uh, I know we had a great context setting in the morning itself with all these speakers and even comments from the audience to say where the impact lies. But my first question I'd like to invite you, Eva ma'am, to actually just lay the context and tell us about, because Meghalaya has not just solar powered a lot of their health facilities, but used that as a catalyst to upgrade its health facilities. And in many ways, you know, our work in Northeast started with states like Meghalaya and Manipur. And there are a number of steps that you've already taken, but I would like to just brutally, honestly want to ask you that what is the impact and experience of your team with this program? And also, do you think we, just, we should sustain it? Because really what OLM is about is sustaining the program. So do you really think that there is experience enough and value enough that we should sustain it? Uh, thank you, Rachita. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Selfo Foundation for inviting me here and also the team which is here with me today. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, it's a great opportunity and a privilege for the state of Minghalia to have Selfo Foundation as one of our partners. As how uh, earlier had mentioned by the, uh, uh, by the panelists in the earlier session saying that, you know, it all started with the COVID-19. The story is the same, even in our state also in Nikhalia. It started with COVID-19 that we were looking out for partners because many of the people had the challenge of coming to the health facilities because it was skeptical because of COVID-19 and we were not able to provide the, the services also. That's how it all started that we were looking for a partner and we've been very fortunate to have established that relationship uh, with Selco from the year 2020 onwards in the month of June. So we have started the solarization, that's one aspect in which we have solarized more than 360 sub-centers and 50 PHCs in our state. And we look forward to complete the entire 600 health facilities uh, by 2024, perhaps maybe in the month of December. That is the first phase in which uh, we have, you know, have taken on that challenge despite, uh, you know, uh, a state like Meghalaya, which has uh, approximately 36 lakhs population with a village of more than 7,000 villages all scattered around the, you know, the beautiful hillocks that we, all, we have and also we have more than 1,200 villages which are difficult and hard to reach. So these are the realities that we all have to face. Having said that, the solarization now we are doing it in all, we are, it's still, you know, uh, it's under progress. With that, from year 2020 till now, 
2024, we have had a number of challenges when it comes to, you know, maintenance of the equipment that we have in these health facilities. We've had time and time discussions, you know, with the team and also uh, with, my, uh, with my colleagues and also with the district who are also here with me today. Uh, they are the ones actually who are, who are actually running it. You know, I sit in the state here, so it's like I just have review meetings with them just to understand how is it going. So actually, they are the ones who are actually doing the work. The, the ENMs, the mid-level healthcare providers, and also the Chokhtar who is posted at the sub-centers. So what we have done in our state is like, we have completed this three years, so it was difficult to get the spare parts, considering that we are in Shillong and Meghalaya, so many of the spare parts we have to get in touch with them, and you know, they identify a local supply for us, so it takes time. Even then, in spite of all that, we are able to somehow uh, continue this uh, training and capacity building, which we have done for all of our frontline workers, that is the ENMs again at LHP, because they are the ones who are there in health facilities day in and day out. They are the ones who actually, you know, are the key people who can maintain those equipments. It's not us at the state, you know, who said they are the ones that who actually require that support. So we as a state, uh, we have, you know, uh, done whatever we can, but I I still know that they still have a challenge. But you know what is there to do work if you don't have challenge? That's where the best ideas comes from. That's where all innovations come from. Yeah. Thank you, Eva, ma'am. And um, just to expand on that a little bit more. So of course, from earlier from Arpan, we we heard about the technicalities around the different components of the of the solar energy system. And of course, like I'd, I'd like to expand on what Eva Mam said because I feel our experience in Meghalaya and the very open partnership that we've had has also helped us to that understanding, right? To say that what are exactly the servicing requirements itself? What are the parts that fail? So when we do the procurement next time, what spare parts do we keep in mind? What training do we do better? But just to expand on that a little bit more, if you could come in first day, because I understand that, you know, we're saying Northeast region, Northeast region, but the states are not so uniform. There are challenges, you know, depending on where you are in the state itself or which state you are in. So if you could just throw a light in terms of, as an enterprise who's trying to look at servicing and maintenance, how do you really plan for it? And, and what are some of the things that you have learned in the past two or three years with this uh, program? Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Rachika, for having me here. Uh, we have been working in the state of uh, Assam and Meghalaya extensively in powering the health facilities. And when we say Assam and Meghalaya, these are two adjoining states. And from someone from outside, it will look like everything will be the same here. But in Meghalaya itself, different pockets have different issues, different problems. If I have to take about East Garo Hills, East Garo Hills have more oh. red soil. It's a hilly terrain and it's a, it has more red soil. Oh, yes, oh, yes. What it happens is when there is rain, and we all know Meghalaya, there will be abundant rainfall. Oh, yes. it, the water in the soil absorbs the chemical of the artery and your artery becomes dry. Tomorrow when there is lightning, the, your system is almost prone to high sarsas, right? And because of that itself, over past one year or so, one and more than two years, we have been facing this problem in East Garo Hills of having lightning issues. Inverters getting tripped. Within one week, we got a prop issue rate of around 20 health sub-centers having lightning strikes. Because your arctic pits were not well protected because of the external factors. So it's only when we install and after that we go in depth in identifying, we get to know what exactly is the problem and we have to come out of a solution from it. So what is the next solution? Maybe we have to use a chemical which doesn't get absorbed faster or refill the arctic pit whenever it is needed. It brings in extra cost which is not projected into our original cost of proposal. So, where from that budget comes in? I'm only citing one example. 
Okay, from where did that puzzle comes in? So when we know that okay, this is the problem and this is happening for this particular district, so I think learning from those uh, issues, we have to allocate certain budget for them. Similar way, if I have to go into the Khasi Hills regions of West and Southwest Khasi, because of the difficult terrain, to reach to one particular PAT, if there is an uh, emergency of say system getting failed tomorrow, there has to be a delivery happening. So what we need to do, I have to hire a vehicle from uh, our destination to that center and get that issue rectified. So again, there what happens? I have to spend seven thousand out of which my total budget for AMC for five years is twenty thousand. I spend in one single visit seven thousand. That way, uh, what we, I mean, over these years, what we have seen is that we have given more emphasis on installation, <coughs> commissioning, but we have not given that much emphasis on how the comprehensive maintenance has to be taken care of. Based on different geographies, different terrains, we need to allocate budgetary allocations. And also, we need to have resources nearer to the centers who can at least identify the issue at first go, so that whoever goes for rectification goes with that particular needed spares with them, so that the issue can be rectified at one go, and there are no multiple visits. Cost is a separate, energy not available is something related to what the first video showed, because of non with uh, access to energy, the mother died. We had access to energy, but we could not resolve and something happened. Is where is the issue is, and that is the gap which we need to uh, resolve. Thank you. So, let's go towards solutioning now. Uh, so, um, Ayush, um, you know, you, we, since morning we've been saying, high transaction costs, transportations are high, and you know how that really looks at the costing of the system. And again, that is important for all of us because the reason that we're really advocating for it is because we want to bring in economic sustainability as well, right? It's not about just the environment. Um, from that perspective and your experience at Schneider as well, what kind of technology innovations can we bring in um, and your response to what Arvan already presented? in ways that we can actually look at this as an opportunity again. How do we really solve this issue of transactions, remote, traveling three or four times to troubleshoot, you know, and then realizing you don't have the right spare parts to actually solve the issue itself? Are there some ideas, some experience that you can share with us? So, uh, first of all, thanks, Rachita, for having me here, and thank you, Selfo Foundation, for I would say this great uh, vision which you have and this great mission you are working towards and uh, everyone here who is in some capacity contributing to it or will contribute in the near future. So thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, now building on what Fazli was saying and what Man just said. So uh, one thing is that uh, obviously in today's world we talk about uh, digitalization and AI and it's, it's a mega trend which will impact uh, uh, everything going forward for the next 10-15 years. So, so uh, you have to leverage technology to whatever extent best possible uh, everywhere. And, and when, when I say a technology in, in this particular case, uh, we, we can have a remote monitoring uh, system or a platform which, which not only uh, records or impacts uh, the impacts uh, which uh, are being witnessed for the project in terms of carbon emissions saved uh, and in terms of let's say the energy generated versus consumed which helps you uh, actually gauge that are you, uh, are you over, have you oversized the system or have you undersized the system but also to have that first check if, if a breakdown has happened is, is it because of a technical issue with the sensor or the meter which you've installed or is it a breakdown which needs to be rectified as Fuzzly was rightly saying immediately because it can have very adverse effects. So building on that, uh, I, I feel that it's very important to have the right kind of 
uh, equipment to be installed to monitor uh, the data on this on this platform which you can use on your mobile or on your laptop but you need to have the base uh, basics right by having the right kind of equipment or the meters or the sensors which which are brand agnostic and which can work with all kinds of equipment they need to uh, have ability to work in low connectivity areas and and uh, particularly in some cases uh, a lot of 2g connection uh, we've seen is something which works in in these areas where uh, 3g or 4g may not be uh, uh, that prevalent so that is one thing and as well as uh, along with all this you also need to be sure that uh, uh, you are dealing with remote uh, areas and uh, rural areas so there needs to be some security so uh, when I am talking about the meter, uh, I am talking about uh, the meter which we have which is basically uh, at Schneider a GSM enabled model but we uh, typically propose to install an IoT enabled SIM because then it becomes, it's highly, uh, it's more secure than your normal SIM and also what happens is that it cannot be used for other purposes uh, just for let's say your mobile or something else. So all this becomes your base and you need to set your basics right. But okay, great to have a platform, great to have all these sensors with all the data flowing, but what do you do with it? So you need to have the right kind of people to actually see uh, which data need to be prioritized. Because it's almost like your mobile, right? Uh, you have 50,000 features in Apple, but uh, does everyone really use it? Okay. So you need to prioritize which, which data are important and finalize those simple things and then uh, leverage on and have the right kind of people to analyze and draw uh, valuable insights and influences which can help Fuzzle or, or anyone who is working on these systems from an operations and maintenance and also from we have to think long term and because this project is not about 2000 sites it's about 25,000 sites and maybe it will become even bigger in the near future. So you have to keep on learning. And, and I feel that uh, every 1-2% to incre uh, incremental, uh, uh, let's say, innovation which you do to improve things, ultimately it compounds into something much bigger. So you have to continuously keep on improving, taking insights from people on the field and building on it and then learn from there and do that. And even uh, as I uh, first said that in the energy meter which is there. So sometimes we uh, like in, in our past experience we uh, got uh, uh, let's say alerts that uh, the system is not working. But it may be a simple issue that uh, the system is running and it's active but uh, the SIM card has not been recharged. So all those things you need to really build in and maybe have some troubleshooting experience right at as ma'am was saying at the site where someone is managing and maintaining the system just not like uh, you don't expect that if a critical breakdown like a short circuit or an overload or something will happen that they can repair it but do the basic troubleshooting so that they can alert the nearest person who, who has the maintenance contract and uh, in 50 to 60 percent of the cases I feel that the, the local troubleshooting and the basic maintenance like simple things like cleaning the panel properly and topping up the batteries with water all these things itself will resolve maybe 60 to 70 percent of the issues and the rest 20 30 percent we uh, we will develop uh, and we have developed in the past at schneider and, and the partners we work with to to resolve the critical issues uh, thank you for that ayush and i think like some of the key things one is of course it can help us do system designs better itself. So one aspect of looking at 25,000 health facilities as a pilot to say what is the most optimized system design. The other is of course the troubleshooting aspect. So if a complete system shutdown happened, you know, we spoke about ownership and maintenance and expecting the staff to call up, but, but this can actually aid them as well because one level of system shutdown can be just reported through the remote monitoring systems also. Uh, slightly more complex, data loggers or sensors if we do, we are actually able to diagnose it as you mentioned. So we're able to plan our visit. If there are small things we can coordinate locally itself only for very special issues which are related to warranty, certain specific component parts, we actually allocate techn uh, technical. But as you rightly also said, 
these are also technologies that might help, especially because we're thinking about the scale of the program, where we are actually trying to look at maintenance models, which is across 400 systems, 1,000 systems, 3,000 systems in a state. Um, and that kind of leads me to Subhashini as well, um, from Ega Foundation, whose work has really been to enable scale. Um, and to enable actually ownership and better decision making across stakeholders. So could you expand a little bit first to just tell us about the work of Ega uh, and, and sharing with us some example of how you've made that system happen for scale itself across different stakeholders. Sure. Um, thank you so much uh, Rachita and uh, Selco Foundation for having me here. Really honored to be part of this gathering and uh, really moved by the kind of impactful work that Selco has been doing and also some of the other speakers, the experiences that they share and the work that they've been doing, uh, you know, uh, as part of the community, really inspiring, very much moved uh, by a lot of the stories that I heard, uh, especially the work by Karna Foundation, uh, you know, as part of the panel that was shared uh, earlier, just before this. Um, compared to all these August luminaries, I think I'm just a garden variety technologist. Uh, I work for Ega Foundation. I'm a senior uh, uh, technical architect with them. I've been in the impact sector for the past seven or eight years now. Um, Ega Foundation is a philanthropic initiative. Uh, it was founded by Nandan Nilekani and Shrikant Nadamani in 2003. And our mission is to make the lives of citizens, uh, each and every citizen, better uh, by making sure that they have access to uh, services that they have a right to. And uh, we believe that to make this happen, it's a combination of Samaj, Sarkar, and Bazaar, making sure that we have the various stakeholders from society, from the governments and the markets, uh, come together on a common platform uh, to make sure that the life of the average citizen becomes better. And we also believe that the way to do this, one of the ways to enable this is through technology. So we build open source platforms for public service delivery. Um, and we've been around for now 20 years. We've just come out of our teenage and uh, <laughs> this is the 20th year of Eagle, so we are on our way to becoming an adult. Um, Eagle runs missions in the urban space. Uh, we run missions in the sanitation space. And we are also running missions in the health space. And we have partnered and worked with a lot of state and national governments. Uh, our platform is live in Odisha, Punjab, Uttarakhand, Andhra Pradesh, um, Chennai. And uh, our health platform is also live uh, going global. Uh, we work in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we uh, have a health campaign platform that's live in Mozambique. And there are many more uh, countries in the pipeline. So this is largely that the work that we do. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that we have found is that when you have these wicked problems, these big problems that need to be solved, regardless of the domain, right? whether it's health or urban or sanitation, uh, education, things like that, we believe in collaborating with partners and we also believe in capacity building. So as to enable the governments that we work with, we can't do this alone. So we would like to impart the knowledge that we have gained uh, by building capacity with the state governments, with our partners, so that more and more people can do what we uh, try to do. And uh, we also believe in uh, getting the ecosystem involved, the market players involved, because that's where true innovation happens. As we have seen with uh, UPI and Aadhaar, these uh, digital public goods, digital public infrastructure that was initially incubated by the government, but now market players have innovated on top of it and have built you know, very creative solutions that have made the lives of average uh, people much easier, much simpler. Um, so we believe in you know, putting out these platforms. We don't do a point solution approach. Uh, we have you know, from a technical standpoint, we have what we call as a platform that can be used in multiple different contexts for service delivery. And we are collaborating with Selco Foundation to, um, on the operations and maintenance piece on how the digital platform can enable, you know, solving some of these ONM issues, help in, uh, you know, speeding up some of these things, provide greater transparency and accountability in the system, and also kind of serve as a catalyst for monitoring and evaluating the program itself. As Ayush rightly pointed out, 
Uh, it's a continuous process. Uh, the most difficult part of any program rollout is the actual execution and the last mile service delivery. And to ensure that this happens in a timely manner, how can technology help? You know, and how can we provide access to accurate and timely data to all the stakeholders who are using the system so that they can take appropriate actions at each level of the hierarchy and improve their processes and uh, you know, make sure that uh, stuff is really reaching the beneficiary whom it is intended for, all the services are there. Um, so we are hoping that the technology solution that we are providing will really aid uh, Selco in the states, northeastern states to really improve last mile service delivery. Thank you, Subhashini. And um, you know, as you as you kind of rightly uh, also mentioned that you know while these tools can be there, which which make that ease of transfer of information happen, more visibility come in in terms of the role of stakeholders. In the in the end, the processes need to be designed by us based on the local context itself. And that is where I feel Meghalaya has taken so many you know, strides in terms of really taking some steps towards what could operations and maintenance look like. And I'd really like to tell everyone as well that you know, while many people across the globe are speaking about powering of health facilities, it's emerging to them that operations and maintenance is critical. Whereas so in that case, just yesterday I was in a, uh, on, on a discussion where WHO and all these global players were there and they were just like, one of the trends we need to look at is how to ensure sustainability, how to look at operations and maintenance and ownership. So I would really want to commend uh, you know, a lot of you in the audience as well, but since we have Eva Ma'am on the panel here, in terms of the steps that the Meghalaya state has already started to take and the learnings that have had to emerge. So if you could please share with everyone on what have your learnings been around ONM, but also some of the very concrete steps that the state have taken to ensure that some of the problem statements that we spoke about earlier, we start towards problem solving. So if you could share that. Thank you, uh, Rachita. Uh, well, uh, in our state, in Italia, uh, we have tried uh, various methods, in fact, uh, you know, when we, uh, when, we, uh, when we got to know that actually the maintenance contract is over and we have to hand over the assets uh, to the government. And you know, in a government system, in a PHC, or even at the district level, you know, the, the, the district head is there. How would we take, you know, accountability and uh, ownership of the assets which is given by the government? We all know here that we work at the government set up. Anything which is the government, no one wants it. No one wants to take accountability of it. So it's a real challenge for us. Though it is a small state, but uh, we had a lot of challenges when it comes to that. So what we decided was initially was uh, to hand it over to the, uh, the district had saying that you know they can take over the assets of whatever you know we have installed in the health facility so that it continues running and we have that sense of you know that it is ours now. We actually have to take care of them because. I have facilities are actually benefiting from it. So, but then we realize that it does not work because the district had will sit something like 150 kilometers away from the health facility where it's actually located. So it's also important that uh, we have uh, tried to institutionalize. You know, we are trying still now, so we're still uh, in the process of that to make the uh, the frontline worker who is actually working in the health facility to give them some kind of a training, a capacity building, which we are doing it right now. Uh, we have completed, I think so, almost all we have trained the uh, frontline workers, that's the uh, a &Ms who are posted there in those sub-centers, and also the uh, mid-level healthcare provider. We've been fortunate enough to have the mid-level mid healthcare provider who's there. So we provide them continuous capacity building and training. We have not had the training even at the block level because we know that it would be difficult for them to travel. So we had it at the health facility itself, which uh, uh, Selco Foundation has, uh, you know, has uh, also helped us in that. Uh, and we have just done the organizing part of getting everyone, you know, on board for this training. And we have not trained only one or two. We have tried to train all, in fact, because again, in the government system, we have a lot of transfers and postings. Someone who has learned today and has picked up will be posted to a PHC or to a CHC. Again, we have the challenge of that continuous capacity building, training, that sense of ownership, accountability. You know, it's a never-ending process. You'll have to keep on trying. 
And uh, again, we have also started the uh, customer relationship management, in which uh, we have uh, two executives, uh, one for the Garudins region. As you know, uh, the Garudins region and the Kasi Jainti region, we are like, uh, like at least six, six hours apart when it comes to time to travel and the language also is different. So we have these two uh, customer uh, CRM executives who sit at the state level and also for the Garudins region, they sit at the Garudins region. They actually make calls, you know, to all these health facilities to find out whether the equipment is, you know, are they working fine, is there any problems, any issues. We try to troubleshoot, you know, from the state level. No, we are doing that, but we also have a toll-free number, which we have, which is known as the state headline number, 14410. We have a headline number in which a medical officer or anyone, any of the, uh, you know, uh, health functionary can actually call this number and register a complaint saying that, you know, this uh, particular health facility has some issue, there was some heavy rain last night, there was some lightning strike, some short circuit, or whatever the issues might be, so that we can troubleshoot, you know, to understand how, how can we rectify that problem. And we have many other issues, like, you know, like uh, getting spare parts, as I mentioned earlier, and getting to the problem and calling the health facility where the technician is available, not available, again, that's another factor. So we still have a long way to go when it comes to that. I'm sure uh, you know other northeastern states uh, will understand that uh, it's not only for uh, for the OLM of the, uh, you know uh, equipments. We also have for the ILR vaccines and so many other issues we have. Which you know it's a continuous learning for us. We learn from each other and we try to listen also to the field staff in understanding what could be the best solutions. Because sometimes the best solution does not come for us. It's localized. You know, in uh, in every place it is localized. So. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And I think like, you know, um, the, the first half of the conversation, we made it too technical. But, you know, this kind of helps us to also bring out that it's not just the technology, but it's really the process innovations that we need as well to make sure that operations and maintenance in the end is going to be sustainable. So every aspect that you mentioned around asset handover, it sounds like an easy task, but as you mentioned in government, uh, you know, it's, it's a different process that we need to figure out itself. Training, how do you really drive ownership and accountability? And then, of course, the, 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 the aspect that we've initiated, which is the toll-free number, where everyone can report. But then after that, what happens if the reporting even comes through? So one thing I would like to point out, as ma'am said, that you know, there's some things that we have figured out, there's some things that we're emerging, but we don't want the states that are going to initiate the program to have the same <coughs> learning curve. So in the, that's the reason that we're all here together, to be able to say what has been figured out so we don't repeat those mistakes. We plan for that from the very beginning and we make our programs more efficient from here on. And I'm sure the next time we're doing it, there'll be learnings coming on from other states as well, which Meghalaya will take forward, Manipur will take forward, and Mizoram as well. Um, so with that, Fazli, like, you know, again, we spoke about the technology aspects itself on how that changes from one region to the other. Because of which issues, like troubleshooting them itself, you know, our, our normal procedures might not work. Uh, but, you know, I know that you've also been thinking about the process innovation of the business side itself, right? Like, how do you really look at transaction costs? And then, if you have to go into these remote regions, what kind of partnerships do you look at? both with the, your suppliers of equipments as well as someone who can help you be the ears and eyes on the ground. So if you could expand on some learnings around those business process innovations. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, we as an organization, we looked at improving ourselves in two aspects. One, in the ground, and second, the back end of having a proper OMM maintenance team and all. So I'll give you a very small example. I mean, there were funders visiting one of the health centers, which was a bigger system. And one day prior, we got an information that the system is not working. The system was working fine till then. So what has happened is actually, and with video call, with bad quality of video call and all, we could not identify what exactly is the problem. The, what has actually happened, someone has hanged a calendar on the MCB. And for some reason, someone has stripped it down. 
and we all were like funders are coming, system not working. What happens to us? Are we going to be kicked out? So I hired a Bolero pickup, dumped a 7 kilowatt inverter into it and went halfway. Somehow we got a better network and we found that that, that MCB was only tricked. So we felt okay, there is a gap in connect. We based up somewhere and people, staff at the center, there is a big gap. So what we try to do is actually to have local resources. Local resources who are being trained on basic maintenance of solar systems. So what we did, we tried looking at from where we can find such resources. Luckily, we got in touch with Snyder. Snyder has a program where they are training local resources on solar maintenance and and accordingly, we have taken them on contractual basis to actually look to our systems. Now, ma'am, mostly in Garo Hills, we have our local resources and we are in the process of identifying it in the Khasisa India region. And maybe in another two, three months, we will at least have one person at the district level to look after the resources. So, this kind of gap. And another place, what has actually happened, I mean, because of the trainings and cross-trainings happening, they got to know the battery needs leadership. So, somewhere the person forgot about the distilled water, what he has done is he has poured more acid into the battery. And all the batteries got damaged, though the system was absolutely fine. And replacement of such batteries is a huge cost. I think you will have to spend around two, minimum of 2 lakh rupees to 3 lakh rupees. So, these local resources, when they go there and they can speak on their own dialect, the, the people can connect better. And that way, even we have reduced the transaction cost. And also, in most of the places, in some of the districts where the grid infrastructure is very poor, Whenever there is a grid failure during monsoon, when the transformer goes off and they repair it, it brings in a high surcharge current. And it destroys a lot of medical equipment in the process. So, whenever there is a grid failure during monsoon, if that local resources can actually uh, communicate with the health staff, it at least be the look into it that you keep your systems or the equipments off, at least for some moment when there is some, or there is a connect between the MECL people. We are going to give you the current now, you please keep everything off. That way, that communication will actually help everyone, all the stakeholders of the ecosystem together. And uh, that is one aspect and that's why the local resources have actually helped us in bringing down our transaction force. Then the second is the Backend OM. When we say backend OM, OM is basically the uh, agreements we have with our suppliers, where ma'am has been saying uh, availability of spares and all. So now we have come into an agreement that if someone is giving on site support, like uh, your sister concerned, Luminous, uh, uh, so Luminous has come into an agreement with us based on the travel time. The turnaround time will be 48 hours and maximum will be 72 hours because they are giving on-site support. Other manufacturers who are not giving on-site support but they are giving off-site support, we have an agreement with them is that they will have to park a certain percentage of their spares based on the quantity procured at our office so that the resolvement of turnaround time is lesser. That is how over these years we have tried improving ourselves to have a better mechanism when it comes to operation and maintenance. Yeah. And I mean that aspect of capacity building but also localization in that way has been incredibly important. And actually another aspect that I'd like to point out is that this aspect that Fazli spoke about is not just the ecosystem for health energy. As I think Venkat sir spoke in the morning, it will spill over to other energy needs in our communities as well. So whether it's livelihood, whether it's home lighting systems, because these are generic issues. 
But if we use the health program to create that ecosystem at large, it can actually benefit larger populations and other developmental needs also. And Ayush, coming to you next, I think like you, know, you, you spoke about, uh, again, different aspects of uh, the way that we could uh, leverage on certain technologies on existing, so retrofit a lot of the you know, uh, already existing um, uh, systems that we have to bring in that aspect of remote monitoring. But often, you know, the, the thing that we also hear is that aren't we complicating the technology? Isn't it too expensive to do that? Right? So could you answer some of those aspects of like what, like how do we really ensure that that happens in a manner that we also understand the economic bearings and the cost efficiency that it brings in? So, I would in fact uh, want to address uh, what uh, Fazli was saying and build on it. So, uh, technology I think it's, as you rightly said, it's complicated, it's boring, but it has to be cost effective and most efficient. So, some of those things which I covered in my, uh, let's say, previously when I was speaking. But we also need to understand, uh, and Man was saying and Fazli was saying that Capacity building is something which is important. Now, why is it important? Because we are living in in an energy transition world. And when I say energy transition world, we are living in it because right now, uh, what Selco Foundation is doing, they are uh, they are trying to solve the challenges which these health centers are facing through renewable energies and decentralized renewable technology. And when, when you have decentralized renewable technology, the biggest challenge becomes, which, which has been highlighted many times, uh, is do we have the skilled manpower to take care of those assets, to do the basic O&M, to do uh, the installation, commissioning, everything. And this is where I think another popular term which many people would hear of, green jobs. So it is becoming more and more important that you enable the local capacity building, have the uh, right kind of people to, to manage these assets which are install, installed in the remote uh, villages. And, and uh, building on to what Fazli was saying that Schneider uh, has a training program which is part of our CSR initiative where we are training about 30,000 youth every year in the field of electricity. And when I say electricity, this is uh, these are two or three types of uh, trainings which we do. One is our basic electrician training program, which is basically to do the basic house wiring, to do the basic fitting of things, MCPs, etc. The second is the renewable uh, or the so solar energy training, which first day uh, was saying has helped him uh, handpick some people, hire them on contract, and which is really helping uh, uh, him in this case. And then also there is the third level, which is more urbanized or for the factories, which is the automation training. So we have, we partner with uh, with almost 400 plus, 450 plus partners uh, who run the training institutes and we provide these, uh, these trainings over there. And why I'm highlighting this is because as Ma'am was saying that even for that basic troubleshooting uh, training for those people, customized trainings can be provided, if not at the, at the uh, training center, maybe online as well so that there is basic knowledge and, and those mistakes of hanging a calendar on the MCB and ripping it by mistake which really pushes it to uh, stone age because it is effectively you are uh, shutting everything down. So that becomes important. And, and I would also like to highlight and we can draw balance from slightly unrelated uh, uh, field but our experience of, uh, of solar in general because this is what I think first day is, is doing, already doing. So we need to have a tiered mechanism of troubleshooting and uh, uh, basically OEM. And, and this we've learned from even more complicated uh, installations of solar water pumping, which we've done on the field. So over there, obviously the ownership becomes easy because it is with self-help groups. And then we, we've typically trained a local operator uh, to manage those solar assets and, and, and it can be solar water pumping, it can be the health centre, it can be the school, it can be anything which is related to the field of electricity that one person can do the basic troubleshooting at the site level or at the, uh, or, or at the local level. 
and then comes the second level which Fazli was saying that he sees now hiring people. So you have to define the duties and segregate it properly. That basic troubleshooting happens at the site level. Second level is that if he's not able to resolve, then it is passed on to the second layer, which is what the local people who are professionally trained or better trained to handle uh, those, those, let's say, slightly more critical issues. And if even if the local person and the, uh, sorry, the site person and the local people are not able to resolve it, then maybe a third layer, which is the experts like Fuzzle, who, who, or, or Schneider, who, who can manage those critical, uh, critical, uh, let's say, maintenance issues and who are more equipped uh, because of their uh, experience of working in the field. So I, I certainly feel that these kind of simple things, even though uh, it's unknowingly maybe we are doing it already, but structuring it strategically will really help in sustenance and resilience of these programs, which coupled with your, uh, let's say, remote monitoring and your technology, etc., becomes a more robust and resilient system. And I guess, like, similarly, as you define, we can have tiers of financial allocations as well, right? So there are some aspects of regular maintenance contracts that need to go out. You know, there are other aspects of, you know, uh, extra servicing visits need to be done, some components need to be replaced, and then system is broken, system is stolen. It needs to be replaced completely, right? So, so I think like this process is again something that can be replicated across the board for every process, every kind of uh, vertical that we see from there on. And that brings me to Subhash because I feel ECOV's role is in a way to simplify all of that as well, right? So if you could, if you could maybe expand, you spoke about uh, what ECOV has been doing in general. But I'm sure your mind is kind of buzzing based on everything that we're saying and saying, oh, we've done that, we can help with that. So if you could say something around the replicability of that or um, the applicability of what EGov has been done, has been doing for this program, uh, especially in terms of uh, how it can help the states take ownership um, and how we can then scale it from there on across the, across the country. Sure. Um, so, one thing I kept nodding my head as everybody here has been talking about, you know, uh, a lot of the locality specific or geography specific challenges that everybody deals with in a country as diverse as India, where the language and water change every 20 kilometers or so. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that one of the learnings that we've had over 20 years that we should not build point solutions that serve a specific Broly. locality. Instead, we should build broader platforms which are configurable, which can be customized for a particular state or geography or locality, <laughs> however uh, you know it's being deployed. So, coming back to the question you asked, Rachida, um, how does the things, uh, how do the products that EGov has built so far, how do they fit into the specific use case, right? So just to take one step back, broadly in our work with governments, what we have seen is if we can get all the stakeholders involved in a particular program or a mission to agree and to have a common platform where they all see the same view of data, I think that itself is like half the problem solved. Because typically what we have found is, you know, people have very different views of actually what's happening on the ground. Like the way Fasle is describing, that might not be the way somebody sitting in an office somewhere else might see it. They may not even know the challenges on the ground or what Ayush has been describing. That's his point of view. So just getting everybody on common ground and saying, hey, this is happening in the system. And, you know, this is, these are the steps that we need to take to solve it. And this is the person responsible for it. And these are the SLAs that need to be set to resolve this problem. Just coming to that common ground, I think that's where the platform aspect comes in. Um, and we've got, you know, we've done this kind of solutioning. We have something called a grievance redressal module um, that has been built on top of digit that is live in multiple states as well as in Mozambique, uh, you know, where people are able to raise incidents and it is assigned to somebody for uh, fixing within a certain SLA. And when they fix it, they say, you know, they mark the complaint as resolved. 
and eventually the person who filed the complaint gets the agency to actually verify whether the incident has been resolved and you know has the option to either close it or reopen it with more comments so on and so forth so we have already done this although it has not been in this specific uh, area we have done this uh, you know, as a generic module and we have deployed it in the urban and health contexts elsewhere. And that is a solution that I'm seeing as a direct fit here as well. Uh, with a little bit of customizations potentially, it can be used here very effectively. This is number one. So this is getting people on board on a digital system. The second challenge uh, uh, that typically we see is that even when you get people on the same system, people don't have clarity as to what needs to happen on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You've got employees, you've got somebody else saying, you know, I've got an incident, but how many incidents do I need to fix? Where are they located? What do I need to do today when I log into the system? This is again something that we have built into the platform where we've got, you know, employee portals, administrator dashboards and things like that, where when an employee logs into a mobile app, they know exactly what is spending on them for resolution. And this is extremely important that we give people the clarity on what they need to do and you know also tell them that hey this SLA is nearing, uh, you need to fix this first before you tackle this so on and so forth because it's very important otherwise people get confused. The intent is there to act but what exactly do they need to do, what is the priority, what is the urgency. That sort of clarity uh, digits platform can bring because we've got this already and we have tested it. Uh, in countries at uh, national scale as well as you know state scale. Um, that's number two. The third piece of the problem that uh, we'll all keep going back to is the uh, administration and policy making piece. Uh, data is extremely important throughout the life cycle of any program rollout um, and especially in the operations and maintenance area. You need to know what sort of problems are coming up, where are they coming from, Who's resolving it? Are we able to resolve it within a given SLA? If not, what is the problem? You know, um, that's extremely important to have a unified data platform, a unified dashboard, which is also timely. There are two aspects to data. One is it has to be timely. Second, it has to be easy to consume in the form of, you know, key performance indicators and things like that. And these KPIs can also vary from uh, state to state from locality to locality and uh, the platform is built in such a way that all these KPIs are configurable and customizable. So, you know, what Meghalaya might want, it may slightly differ from what Mizoram might want. And we have the ability without making a code change to just, you know, change certain configurations and you'll be able to see different KPIs as applicable to different states. And this is very important, the data piece, because ultimately technology is just an enabler. Uh, it serves you know, the program and the ultimate mission of making people's uh, lives better. So having timely real-time or near to real-time dashboards with accurate data is extremely important and that's what our platform can enable. And once people know what is going on in the system, and of course that, you know, opens up a realm of possibilities where people will start uh, seeing patterns, right? What Arush mentioned earlier, they can do analytics on top of it. And maybe they will find that, you know, a certain geography, that's where most of the complaints are coming in from. You know, why? What's going on? And maybe it can be tied down to a particular OEM, maybe a defective batch of uh, spare parts or equipment or things like that. And this will help even the OE, uh, OEM manufacturers and the vendors as well to improve their processes at their end so that they know what's going on and they can make their products much better for consumption. So overall, I think this whole monitoring and evaluation piece just gets into a virtuous cycle where all the stakeholders benefit from it and they are able to improve their processes and ultimately the entire system sort of rises up to the next level. And you know, you start thinking of higher order analytics, higher order things instead of focusing on basic things like, uh, can I get this fixed or will I be able to get this fixed? So you will start to see a gradual rise in the kind of questions that people ask and in the sorts of insights that people get and what problems they need to solve at the next level. And this has been our experience, we've seen this happen live on the ground. Um, for example, uh, in Mozambique, we are uh, currently doing a bednet campaign where we are distributing, uh, you know, uh, pesticide sprayed bed nets to control malaria. And uh, well, um, you know, based on the data that's flowing in, we are getting a fairly good idea about coverage, 
where the hotspots are, where the deliveries are not happening. And based on that, we, the program team is also making decisions in terms of, you know, where do you need to deploy resources? Okay, this area has got very good coverage, so we don't need more resources here. We need to pull them out and deploy them in this province, where there needs to be better coverage. And also budgeting, forecasting, allocation, all these things sort of play in, uh, from having real-time data that flows in, and then you get to make some of these good decisions, which affect people's lives. Um, so this has largely been our experience, so, you know, and we hope to see something similar happen in our work with SEPO, especially in the state of Meghalaya and other states as well. And this is something that we we are looking to integrate with the Energy for Health program as well to really help with the operations and maintenance and we will be launching that soon and um, uh, like discussing the operationalization of it with the states as well. But I have, I think like, 10 minutes, so maybe, um, I hope there are questions in the audience, because that's always a sign of oh. that something sparked. Uh, so we'll do maybe one round of questions. If we can get two or three questions, I see Venkat sir is here, and then if you could please raise your hands. I know everyone's just like, just give us lunch and let us go, but <laughs> no. if there is uh, one or two questions, please, then that would be great. And after the questions, while we get the mics there, uh, what I want is just like one sentence from all the panelists to close, to say according to you, from the discussion so far, your experience so far, one main thing that you feel is an absolute priority that we should set for this program to ensure ONM happens properly. Um, Venkat sir, and then please, questions, we have time for one more. Okay, do that. So, uh, one aspect which I wanted from the panel is that, uh, so, so here the panel is having the experience in global level, especially Shire Snyder is here. So, uh, looking at uh, the countries that you are working, like, you know, uh, African countries, can we, some of that experience, bring it to this uh, platform, this, especially Northeast? And uh, because that is very important, the global experience coming to the country. The second is Subhashni uh, regarding uh, this. Uh, we have experience working with uh, Ego Foundation, especially 10 by ICU project. We have used this uh, uh, equipment management software. And I think that will have a great impact here. Uh, so these two things I wanted to bring it. So Ayush and then Subhashni, but we'll take the two more questions there, ma'am, please. Uh, thank you, Rachita. I am Ashwati Goswami from the Center for Northeast Studies and Policy Research, CNES. This is not a question, actually. Uh, this was more, you see, a uh, thank you, a uh, lot of gratitude to Selco for supporting us in our uh, outreach program, the boat clinics uh, which run in the Brahmaputra, we have 15 such units and Selco Foundation has been very supportive of our initiative and uh, thanks to Selco we have, you know, our boats, uh, four of them, we have a solar panels, the one in Marjuli which is the largest boat, uh, you know, it's lit up in the evening, our nurses feel very safe, there's a lot of confidence. ILRs have also been given and uh, we look forward uh, to more such partnership with Selco which is doing wonderful work here in the Northeast. Thank you. Thank you ma'am. We have one more question at the back. But before we take that question, I think uh, the innovation lied in the idea of boat clinic itself ma'am. So I think more to you than us but, uh, but look forward to discussing. Thank you so more. much. Yeah. Tomorrow we will be having our managing trustee. Uh, Mr. Sanjay Hazarika joining oh, you all. So you will, uh, you know, get it from the horse's mouth yes. tomorrow. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you. I think we'll all look forward to it. So your question please at the back. Uh, hello everyone. I am Anil uh, from ODC. Uh, so my question is to uh, all the panelists. It most, uh, as we know that uh, the investment in terms of solar energy is going uh, on a heavy lead. And everybody is, you know, installing a solar power plant maybe uh, everywhere. And especially when we are talking right now is in the health sector. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the operation and maintenance, there is a very low budget, you know. Uh, so 
what could be the outcome when we are keeping our budget low uh, and then we are expecting the system to perform for next 25 years so what measures or what precautions needs to be taken those who are installing the solar power plant maybe sure so i use the and then anyone who would want to take on the last question maybe firstly So I wish we could. So, uh, so uh, when to your uh, point, uh, when I was talking about all these uh, pointers, these were obviously incorporating our experiences of different geographies. Um, and I would like to highlight that in India we are much more structured. I would say, and uh, we have thanks to government programs and so much of support, such great uh, partners we have. Uh, who can do the installation, commissioning, ONM, etc. Obviously, challenges will be there and they need to be innovatively resolved as we progress. Uh, Africa, there are many, much, uh, many and much more challenges, particularly in, in uh, several countries which, which often get neglected. And, and uh, there are geopolitical challenges, there are challenges of finding the right kind of people uh, who will uh, survive. So once you train, will they even survive the journey of uh, continue to be in that solar space or, or will they do something else? So those are many challenges which, which uh, we face. But overall, when I spoke of all these pointers, I would say that these are pointers which are applicable even in Africa or Asia or India or Latin America. So that, that would be my answer to Yeah, Venkat sir, definitely we will explore the equipment monitoring module that you are mentioning. We'll look into it. Um, as we were having this discussion, I also, a lot of thoughts were running in my head. Uh, we are doing some work in Odisha with the government of Odisha where we have integrated data from IoT sensors. We are looking into integrating data flowing from IoT sensors from the city of Puri, uh, which has uh, you know managed to deliver uh, drinking water straight from the tap. So they've got a lot of IoT sensors in their pipelines and things like that. So uh, one of the things that we are looking at is how can we get this data streamed into our data platform and you know use it for monitoring and evaluation. So something similar along the lines of what you're mentioning and definitely we will explore this module that you've mentioned from uh, Embed ICU. But yeah, the possibilities are endless. Yeah. Once we've got a platform approach, then we can uh, you know pull in data from various different sources yeah. and provide insights. Yeah. I think we, we already have you know a whole chain that we understand as health practitioners. We spoke about telediagnostics, Dr. Kumar spoke about that, and I think telemed ICU in many ways is like a hub and spoke model to monitor ICUs. Um, so even places, I think we all spoke about ICUs being there in COVID, but then you know you don't have medical staff everywhere, right? That's also a problem. And this whole model, module was to help actually buffer that gap, which might be very relevant for some new innovations that might come up for Northeastern states as well. Um, so just last thoughts, just one sentence each on what you feel we should, as a program, keep in mind as an absolute priority for the coming year. Sure, yes, yeah. <laughs> Two words primarily, sustainability and capacity building at all levels, uh, whether it's software or equipment or maintenance, at all levels I think we definitely need to do capacity building so the local people are enabled to do this and you know build sustainable whether it's software or equipment, it has to be sustainable and last for a long time, so yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot there was one more question there on uh, how do we look at financing for ONM. So if anyone wants to cover on that as a closing point. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so to answer first to your question, uh, see, uh, we, def we definitely need more budget for AFC. That is the first pointer. But with the limited resources, whatever we have, how to design a proper system implementation is that we need to have very strong procurement policy. If we only go any MNRE approved panels, things will not work. We need to have very strong procurement pa uh, policy. Procure quality products, install quality installations and do 
After that, we need to have post-installation audit that whether everything is installed properly or not. And that itself will reduce to a great extent, at least 30 to 35% of your OM expenses. So that's how one of the factors which we can reduce, but that doesn't, uh, uh, I mean, so that doesn't mitigate that we need more resources. I mean, more budget. Definitely we need more budgetary allocation based on the geography. And I think a different, uh, there has to be a completely separate discussion based on the states and the geographies and the locations, separate budgetary allocation definitely is needed. And to the last pointer, uh, to add on to what Vasni has said, capacity building, along with capacity building, are a reward and recognition to the health staffs. Let them be motivated. If we motivate them, half of our issues will be resolved at the site itself. Then even our cost of AMC will come down by 50%. Because uh, ma'am, we have the installations in Meghalaya which are installed two years back and it still looks as good as new installation because the system has been maintained properly. Because that person has been, I mean, he is self motivated. But in a similar way, we need to motivate others also. Definitely, yes. Thank you. So I would say that uh, follow an into and approach right from surveying the site to getting and sizing the right kind of system, having the right kind of products and quality products uh, and not just any kind of MNRE or whatever uh, panels and have the right kind of system which talks to each other, all the parts should talk to each other and then having the right kind of ONM processes in place as I was mentioning the three tiered structure which is more, let's say, physical or the local capacity building, which I was saying. And then having the technology to supplement it, because alone technology will just feed some random data, which, which may not be totally useful. So it has to be a good mix and good balance of uh, technology plus the capacity building or the physical intervention. And, and I think as you are already doing, I think uh, uh, incrementally focus on improving uh, small small things every time because ultimately the compounded effect will be much more uh, much better than what you've witnessed in the past so that, that's what I would say well for me uh, it's a big learning experience thank you to all the other panelists here uh, to uh, take away I would say uh, I really like what you had mentioned regarding the escalation mechanism in tier wise. I think so that's important and essential to understand where all are the uh, you know loopholes where we can plug in for the uh, basic, the first and the second and the third tier. And also the SLA is how I had mentioned. I think so that's also really important to understand uh, to what capacity which actually a problem can be solved up to what level. Uh, these are the two key uh, takeaways which I think that you know we as a state can implement that. And uh, also, I'm not looking only at sustainability, uh, you know, even at the, at the government level. I will look at sustainability, self-sustain in a health facility. I think so, just being run by those people there, so that they don't need to actually, you know, escape any kind of mechanism because they're very simple uh, equipments. Uh, I, I look forward to that, actually. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you so much to our panelists. A big round of applause, please. Um, and just to kind of, I think, you know, we, we started with very detailed kind of understanding of what we've learned so much on where technology fails. Uh, we went into that, moved into like the innovations around processes also that we need. But as like a last point, I would like to mention that in the end, we say solar panel, we say everything, you know, but there are people who are responsible behind actually executing the program and making sure the processes come up. And that's what we really need to focus on. And of course, the things that all our panelists mentioned, whether it's the processes, the clarity on the roles, who's going to be making the decisions, do they have the capacity? Those are the gaps I feel we need to look at. Um, financing is not the gap, but financing needs to be utilized in the best way possible at the right level. And that's the piece that I hope we can get back um, with more learnings. Uh, I also hope that we didn't overwhelm the audience uh, for, for whom many of these terminologies might be new. But I'd like to assure you that 
you work with the human body, which is far more complicated than any of these technologies that were mentioned there. So it's all very easy as long as we work together and we rely on each other's expertise uh, as well to develop the right processes. So thank you so much. Another round of applause and to you. Thank you to all our dear speakers. And that was yet another engaging conversation. We would uh, be uh, given a small token of our gratitude to our panelists and we would request for a few. If we all could give them a round of applause. such an enriching conversation. We know that there is no silver bullet to it, but obviously with these kind of discussions, strategical planning, we can come up with solutions that will probably reach out to more people. So we will break for lunch now. Uh, we'll get back and meet together uh, at 2.30. In the next session, we have three separate specific groups uh, divided in different state-specific programs and strategic discussions. Apart from that, I would also like to tell the audience and the participants that we have different stalls uh, demonstrating different health equipments, technologies and approaches. Uh, you can please visit them post-lunch as well as network during this period, uh, especially to the participants who will not be part of the specific group discussions. And uh, later to that session, we have our esteemed guest today, Dr. Ravi Kanan, who will be addressing the audience.